Hello, thank you for joining us today for this video presentation. I'm Zach Tedder. And I'm Justin Hammes, and we'll be discussing cognitive behavioral therapy for children with anger and aggression. How many of us have encountered or observed a child pose in this manner? Or yelling, throwing tantrums, or fighting? Most children are referred to clinicians based on disruptive behaviors similar to this and majority of these behaviors most likely include anger, aggression, or non-compliance, which can be exhibited in various ways, and these three that I've mentioned are seen across different diagnoses. Now, anger is a two-part process which includes anger experience and anger expression. Anger experience is the internal thoughts and feelings that are being processed by the mind based on external stimuli and the environment. Anger expression is the way that the person acts out these thoughts and feelings either by expressing them outwardly, using coping skills, or even being passive with the feelings. Since it is a two-part process, one can occur before the other or simultaneously be engaged, which leads us into aggression. Aggression is a behavior that can result from the internal feelings and the effects are either self-harm harm to others or property destruction. Relational aggression can be the most subtle forms of aggression and can be either verbal or physical. Overt, covert, and social aggression are all forms of social manipulation of peer relations in order to harm other individuals. Overt behaviors can be either arguing, fighting, threatening to withdraw your, your friendship from another and we have covert behaviors which are either lying, spreading rumors, um, emotional manipulation through guilt or shame. Social aggression is a combination of overt and covert behaviors including nonverbal aggressive behaviors such as ignoring an individual, providing dirty looks, or totally disregarding a person. Now some individuals do use social aggression in order to maintain and or improve their status within peer relations. Reactive subtypes of aggression can be impulsive and reactive. Impulsive can be the uncontrollable rage or anger that is being expressed without the thought before the action. When being reactive, it is reacting to a real or perceived threat and accompanied by expressions of anger and the goal is to react to that threat and harm the individual at the same time. It is effective, so it is anger filled and unplanned and you have the ability to be more hostile and hostility can be seen as the tendency or vulnerability to experience anger. Proactive subtypes of aggression are instrumented in the fact that hurt is being delivered to another individual as well as serving the purpose of some acquisition of reward or monetary gain. It is positive from the person's aspect and can be either planned, premeditated, or delivered in action and it is also unemotional to the person expressing the aggression. When discussing the prevalence of anger with children and adolescents, Physical aggression is typically seen more with boys than with girls. This is not saying that girls are excluded from expressing physical aggression. However, boys tend to express themselves through physical contact. Relational aggression and other covert behaviors can be seen with girls more than with boys. As I previously mentioned, no one gender is excluded from exhibiting these behaviors. When discussing ODD or Oppositional Defiant Disorder, there's a 3 to 2 ratio of boys to girls having this diagnosis and a 4 to 1 ratio of boys to girls having conduct disorder between the ages of 9 and 17. One assumption that can be made about children with ODD transitioning over to conduct disorder can be ineffective treatment and their behaviors increasing with intensity. However, if we are able to intervene at an early age, there's a greater success rate. When discussing etiology or the source of these problems with anger, we will compare reactive and proactive environments. Reactive environments tend to be harsher and more threatening to the welfare of the child, especially since it is an unstable environment. 
we can see different forms of abuse such as verbal, physical, or sexual. There is a greater chance of code parenting due to increased stress on the parent or parents and can lead to family dysfunction. There usually is a temperamental disposition such as anxiety, emotional dysregulation, and inattentiveness. We see deficits in problem solving and the inability to provide alternatives to a situation. These children can lack the ability to express themselves verbally and have psychomotor delays which can lead to them lashing out. Proactive environments encourage and foster the use of aggression in order to obtain the goals or rewards that they see fit. They typically have aggressive role models such as parent, friend of the family, sibling, or peers. These individuals typically can be seen in groups that have the same proactive mindset. They associate aggression in positive outcomes and have greater self-esteem for expressing these behaviors. Some of the diagnoses where these behaviors can manifest are oppositional and defiant disorder, conduct disorder, autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. If we start with ODD or oppositional defiant disorder, losing temper, arguing with adults, actually refusing to comply, annoying people, blaming others, deliberate lateness, failure to respond are some of the most frequent forms. Now when we go on to discuss conduct disorder, it's just an intensification of anger and violent behaviors and in turn can lead to sociopathic or criminal personality disorder. Autism spectrum disorder, anger and aggression can be seen through the inability to express themselves verbally. They can become agitated and lash out due to frustration and speed and intensity is extreme and unable to pause and think of strategies. Um, with depression, the anger because of the current state will erupt and the end result is either guilt and self-loathing of their behavior, irritability, or low emotional tolerance. With anxiety and panic disorder, there is overly sensitive and irritability, especially when stressful situations and feel overwhelmed. Now we're going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and anger is part of the survivor's response to trauma. Their survivor instincts kick in and help combat these threats and focus all behaviors toward the problem, often common in exploitation and violence. Now with OCD, they try to decrease their anxiety by doing the compulsion and when they cannot alleviate it, they become angry or agitated. Since anger and aggression can take on many forms, there is a multitude of assessments that can be administered in order to obtain meaningful data. However, there is not a gold standard assessment, but combining assessments will be conducive to the accuracy of the intervention's success. Some assessments administered by the clinicians, such as the interpersonal hostility interview, where the client discusses how they will react to potential situations. There are also behavioral assessments for a more objective look at the results of aggression and self-report measures to get the child's perception on their behavior. Having self-report assessments and parent and teacher reported questionnaires can be beneficial such as the Disruptive Behavioral Rating Scale, which is mainly used with ODD clients where the parents and teachers can rate the child's anger outbursts at home and at school. We also have the Home Situation Questionnaire, which is mainly used for rate and non-compliance of the child within the home environment. Untreated effects of anger and aggression can lead to peer rejection, educational failures, delinquency, substance abuse, unemployment, and or depression. And these behaviors can continue to increase in frequency and intensity and that is why it is beneficial to have good evidence-based interventions implemented into the treatment plan. Yeah. Understanding what goes into a good treatment plan involves understanding the ultimate goals of therapy, which include decreasing the frequency and intensity of anger episodes, as well as decreasing the other symptoms associated with anger, such as depression and anxiety. 
Also, we're going to be working on increasing alternative interpersonal coping skills that are non-angry based, so being calm and relaxed. We're also going to be working on enhancing significant relationships because it turns out that's where a lot of anger issues come from. We are going to be working on the reduction of anger, not the eradication, because healthy, functioning human beings have anger, and it's okay. But when it's out of proportion, it becomes a problem. So, to address these ultimate goals, we have to work on instrumental treatment goals. And this includes decreasing heightened physiological arousal, decreasing cognitive distortions, and improving interpersonal skills. So we start with decreasing physiological arousal, and we assess this on a subjective scale of 0 to 100 measured by the client. We're going to work on the interventions of relaxation training, exposure therapy, and mindfulness meditation. Relaxation training involves substituting a new condition response for the previous response. So instead of an anger response to a certain stimuli, we want a relaxation response. And we call this relaxing, not reacting. So hormones are released in arousal states that take over our cognitions and behaviors. And what we want to do is interject so we don't get to that angry place where these hormones take over and we behave in these uh, aggressive manners. The strategies implemented for relaxation training are progressive muscle relaxation. This is where we have the children tense up certain areas of their body, like their arms and their shoulders, and then let them go. So they know what it's like to be stressed and relaxed. We also implement self-talk training, teaching them how to talk to themselves in a more peaceful and calm manner, as well as visualization, and this is things like picturing a beautiful, calm, peaceful beach. The use of exposure therapy with anger treatments is based on the fact that there are similar physiological arousal symptoms with anger and anxiety, and studies have shown to be effective with anger and anxiety for exposure therapy. Now the idea behind this is to produce a habituation effect. So when kids face a stimuli, their physiological arousal heightens, but after time it tapers off. And the more they're exposed to this, the lower and lower their physiological arousal gets. And also, the quicker it tapers off. So as it's, as it's getting lower and lower, it, there's less physiological stimulation and the effects wear off. So they get more exposed to it and their responses aren't as extreme. Mindfulness meditation helps foster an understanding and awareness of internal anger responses. And this isn't necessarily sitting with our legs crossed, saying OM, like we usually think of meditation. But it just means being more mindful of these external triggers and the internal feelings associated with them. And it helps bring the practitioner into the present moment and focus on the here and now. The next instrumental goal we're going to focus on is decreasing cognitive distortions. And as clinicians, we're going to assess this through self-monitoring of anger episodes. And that means these situational anger triggers, as well as the thoughts, images, and behaviors associated with them. The interventions we're going to implement are cognitive restructuring, problem-solving therapy, forgiveness skills, and humor. Cognitive restructuring involves identifying anger-related cognitive variables such as hostile anticipation of events, so that's expecting bad things to happen, distorted interpretation of events, so if a neutral event happens, you interpret it as being harmful or threatening, or dysfunctional schema of others, so expecting other people to be harmful or be out to get you. All of the strategies used in cognitive restructuring involve identifying and altering these maladaptive thoughts. There has been shown to be an increased effectiveness of cognitive restructuring when used in combination with the previously discussed relaxation techniques. Problem solving therapy helps increase the coping ability of stressful situations. We're going to target cognitive factors that negatively impinge on the child's problem solving orientation or how they view the problem, such as insurmountable. And then we're going to target the self-assessment of their problem-solving abilities. Like if they view that they can't overcome an obstacle and they don't have the abilities, we're going to teach them abilities to help them overcome these challenging situations and obstacles. 
Forgiveness skills can be crucial, since many angry thoughts are geared towards the wrongs that other people have perpetrated against a person. Forgiveness is often difficult in these situations because of commonly held myths, such as forgiveness is forgetting. Mm -hmm. and that's the idea that forgiving a person is like treating them as if a situation never occurred. Well, lots of the times when we hold on to anger is actually more uh, painful to us to do it than it is punishing to the other person, which is the intent of holding on to it. And we're going to teach kiddos how to just let that go. Humor can help decrease angry cognitions by teaching a kid to laugh off certain situations. And that's basically showing them how overdramatic or uh, out of place some of their angry reactions are and how it can kind of be funny. This is done mostly by modeling from the therapist. Improving interpersonal skills is the third and final instrumental goal. And this is measured by clinicians through observations and a variety of assessments, which Justin went through earlier. The interventions involved to improve interpersonal skills are communication skills training, assertiveness skills training, conflict management skills training, problem solving therapy, social skills training, positive attitude training, and group therapy. Communication skills training is used because angry children are often deficient in verbal and nonverbal communication skills. The focus areas of communication skills training are empathy, so understanding other people's perspectives, listening and eye contact, which often go hand in hand, as well as clearly stating needs and requests. Assertiveness skills training involves learning how to express positive feelings, so saying how you like something, refusal of requests, learning how to say no, and the expression of negative opinions in a manner that is considerate and respectful of others. We're going to learn how to apply this by identifying these behavioral deficits, rehearsing assertive behaviors, and learning how to apply them in real life situations. Conflict management skills training helps teach kids how to cope with a difference in opinion or conflicting goals between people. This usually involves bargaining, trade-offs, and compromises. This helps increase the likelihood of mutual satisfaction or dissatisfaction between parties because everybody knows the key to a good compromise is that everybody's unhappy. This can also include behavioral contracts so that both parties know what's expected of one another. Problem solving therapy as it relates to improving interpersonal skills helps children solve issues in daily interpersonal interactions. And it helps by defining problems clearly and accurately and then brainstorming alternative solutions as well as increasing the effectiveness of personal decision making. It also helps decrease avoidant and impulsive responses in interpersonal situations. Social skills training helps teach kids ways to manage anger in social situations. This includes identifying frequent stressful and anger prone situations and providing information in psychoeducation with regard to behavior chains and how the triggers are chained with the reactions and behaviors. Also, it helps provide planful and effective alternative ways of responding to these anger triggers. Then comes rehearsal of these new skills in role play situations with the therapist and others, as well as positive feedback for any real life behavior changes. Positive attitude training helps broaden the thought action repertoire by building enduring personal resources for these kiddos. And we're going to do this by helping them adopt the patience to wait through certain situations as well as the acceptance of others and the fact that they might be a certain way that they don't like. This also ties in with tolerance and teaching them to put up with certain situations and people even though they don't like it. We're also going to work on forgiveness to help reduce internal hostility. Group therapy is most effective in small groups and it's important to focus on individual motivation obstacles as well as increasing readiness to change at an individual level though in a group setting. And this helps offer good social feedback from people they learn to be close to as well as modeling from other people including the therapist. It also helps normalize these feelings and makes them feel like they're not alone or it's not just them.
Uh, peer encouragement also plays a big part in this because they get support from others around them who are going through similar issues. And it's also important to help reinforce these skills as they're being utilized in new real world situations. All right, so all of this sounds well and good, I'm sure, but you're probably asking yourself, does CBT work for anger? And to answer this question, they conducted a meta-analysis in 2004 titled Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Anger in Children and Adolescents. And in this study, they found that skills training and multimodal treatments were more effective in reducing aggressive behavior and improving social skills. Also, problem-solving treatments were more effective in reducing the subjective anger experience. Included in these studies was also that modeling, feedback, and homework techniques were positively related to the magnitude of the effect size. So what this breaks down to is what we were talking about before and including problem solving techniques and skills training in a multimodal format will help reduce aggressive behavior, the subjective anger experience, and improve social skills. And all of these um, findings were incorporated in this book that was co-authored by one of the authors of the meta-analysis titled Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Anger and Aggression in Children. This helps walk through a session-by-session -session treatment plan incorporating many of the things that we talked about to help reduce anger in children and adolescents. There are also games out there such as this one, Chill Skills, that provide information and coping skills and offer situations to role play for adolescents and teens to help work on their anger issues and coping skills. Well, that concludes our presentation over CBT for anger and aggression in children and adolescents. I hope that what we presented on today has been informative and can be used in the future with other children that you may encounter. And once again, I'm Justin Hammonds. And I'm Zach Tedder. And have a good day. Thank you.